Hi, this is Peter Brown from Bio 108. We're going to talk about flowering plants and their structure and function. So here's a papaya tree, and papaya trees are flowering plants, and you can see it's producing all these papaya fruits. So this is going to go through. This lecture is going to go through from seed to seed. So how a flowering plant starts out as a seed, and then flowers and produces fruit, and inside the fruit is seeds as well. So here's seed germination. Seeds always surprise me because I always say, oh, this looks dead, this isn't gonna work. But we kind of get around that by saying, well, seeds are dormant or sleeping. And if you give them water and warm conditions, they'll start growing. And so here's a bean seed and the root comes out first and then starts growing root hairs. And then a structure sometimes called the seed leaf or the cotyledon comes out and in a die caught, usually it comes out, out of the ground and you have two cotyledons, so die means two. And then the true leaves emerge. And the function of the cotyledon is to uh, take all the starch that's stored inside the seed and remobilize that into the growing plant until the leaves come out and it can do photosynthesis. Okay, here's a monocot. So a monocot is also a flowering plant, and corn is an example of a monocot. In monocot, the cotyledon stays inside the seed, and the first leaf to come out is the true leaf, and you can see the roots and the shoot, and by, by 14 days or so, you'll probably have three leaves. Uh, here's a lovely video that's gonna show the germination of a green bean. Okay, so as we go through this lecture, we'll talk about monocots versus dicots. Flowering plants arose about 100 million years ago and almost immediately separated into two groups, the dicots and the monocots. And so because they've been separated for so long, their structures are very different. And they're both very successful groups of flowering plants. And so we'll talk about monocots and dicots. Uh, as we go through this lecture, we'll talk about plant organs. We're familiar with uh, animal organs like our heart and lungs and our brain. And so in plants, it's things like flowers and fruits and roots and stems and leaves. So here are some plants and we're showing you the function of roots. They did a nice job showing the roots here. And the roots anchor the plant in the ground. They're absorbing the water and nutrients from the soil. and Roots are also oftentimes storing starch, so it's energy for the plant. So monocots have fibrous roots. So if you dug up the grass in your lawn, you wouldn't find one big root. You'd find a lot of little roots all spread out. They have a lot of surface area to, to, because they want to get as many nutrients and water as possible. Uh, a dicot root, like a dandelion, would have a big tap root, so one main root and then smaller roots coming off. Uh, so these are buttress roots. They come out of the ground and they're supporting this heavy tree and that's more common in tropical areas. Okay, on from roots to stems. So stems hold the leaves up and they also connect the leaves to the roots in the ground. Uh, so here's a tree, and so the leaves are all along that tree, and the roots are in the ground, and the trunk is a stem, and all the divided branches are stems. So they're uh, in charge of supporting the tree and also in transport of water and nutrients back and forth between leaves and roots. Okay, so there are two kinds of pipes and plants. They're called xylem in the blue and phloem in the orange. So just like your hot and cold water have to be carried in different pipes, the xylem carries water and nutrients from the soil up to the leaves, and the phloem will carry sugars from the leaves down to the roots, but at times the phloem will also carry sugars to the flowers and fruits, so the phloem goes up and down. Here's a cutaway of a stem of a corn plant and stem of a clover. So the corn plant is the monocot 
And you can see it has bundles scattered throughout of xylem and phloem. The xylem are the bigger holes and the phloem the smaller, smaller holes. And the vascular bundles in dicots are different. Here's a clover plant and the phloem is on the outside. The xylem are the bigger holes on the inside. And in between is a layer of stem cells called the vascular cambion, which gives rise to new xylem and new phloem. Okay, so we're on to leaves. Uh, leaves are what we think about when we think about a plant usually. And leaves are these flat organs that are responsible for capturing sun and doing photosynthesis. Their uh, green pigment is chlorophyll that's going to capture the sunlight. You can see this dicot leaf is full of veins and a whole network. And then there's a leaf stem that's connecting it to the main uh, stem of the tree, and that's called a petiole. Here's a monocot leaf. In a monocot leaf, the veins run parallel. Okay, this leaf also has a uh, red pigment. That's why people grow it. It's called purple heart. So it's a very pretty leaf. So chlorophyll is a main pigment, but some plants have accessory pigments to help capture more of the sunlight. And this one in particular is grown because it's full of anthocyanin. So we'll look at leaves in lab, and leaves come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, one last thing about leaves is they do gas exchange. So everybody knows that animals like us take in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants are the opposite. They grow using carbon dioxide, and they get rid of oxygen. And since leaves are waxy to save water, they have these special cells that open up to let in carbon dioxide and let out water. And these cells are called stomata. Plural is, uh, singular is stoma. Usually I'll call them stomata. Okay, so here are flowers. Flowers are the sexual reproductive organ of the plant. And here's a cactus flower in bloom from a notocactus minimus. All right, so here's a diagram of a flower. You don't have to know all these parts. It's very detailed how they labeled it. But you should know the four basic worlds. So the outer world, the green part right here, it's called the sepal. And then everybody knows the petals uh, are the colorful part and the smelly part. And then going from outside to inside, the male part is a stamen. It has the word men in it. And then in the middle, the female part is called the pistil. So this just tells you what the function is of those parts, that the sepal protects the unopened flower bud and supports the flower. The petal is brightly colored and smelly to attract the pollinators. The stamen is the male part that produces the pollen grains, which contain the sperm. And the pistil is the female part. That's what's going to enlarge and ripen into the fruit. And monocot versus dicot flowers. In monocots, the floral parts are in threes and multiple of threes. So you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six petals. If you look at the stamen, there are one, two, three, four, five, six stamen. And the thing in the middle is your pistil. And you can see even that has three projections from it. In dicot flowers, the floral parts are generally in fours or fives and multiples. So this is an apple flower, or sorry, this is an orange flower. And one, two, three, four, five. And I tried counting the stamen and you can try, I got about 20. So there are likely 20 there. And so um, then if you look down here, here, let me minimize myself. If you look even the, um, pistil, which develops into the orange, if you count the compartments within the orange, you'll get 10 of these. Okay, uh, sometimes flowers are on a branch protrusion at the end called an inflorescence. So you have many, many flowers at the very end. So here's a lilac and here's an inflorescence of a lilac and another inflorescence of a lilac. 
And so you get these clumps just full of flowers. All right, so I've separated out the male and female parts to label them more closely. So the male part is this at the end and the screen thing coming down. And the stringy part that holds up the anther is called the filament. And the top of the part that produces the pollen grains is called the anther. Okay, for the female part, uh, there are three parts of pistils divided into. There's a stigma at the top, that's where the pollen grain is gonna land. There's a style, so the pollen tube will grow down through the style. And then within the ovary are the ovules, which are the eggs. And so a different pollen grain has to fertilize each of the eggs. So flower plants have been on, on land for 100 million years. And so plants sort of have a love-hate relationship with animals. Plants don't like animals because a lot of animals will eat them, but plants use animals to spread their pollen grain and move it to the stigma of the next flower. So in return, they give the insects a sweet sugary substance called nectar. So here are bees feeding on the plant, and besides nectar, the bees actually eat a little bit of the pollen, but a lot of the pollen sticks to their body, and when they go to the next flower, they carry the pollen along with it. Uh, it's a nice little pollination video, and I have a little quiz and some questions on it. You can see that a lot of flowers just have general pollination mechanisms. They're very open, and any insect or butterfly or uh, bird could pollinate this dandelion. Other flowers are very specific. So this is a long tubular red flower, so a bee couldn't get in there. Um, but a hummingbird has adapted to pollinate this flower by having a long skinny beak. So about half of all flowers are very general in terms of their pollin pollination mechanisms, and about half are very specific. So pollination isn't fertilization. Pollination is the pollen grain landing, landing on the stigma on the pistil. The fertilization is the grain grows a structure called a pollen tube down to the ovule, and then the sperm has to go and meet the egg. Okay. About half of all um, flowering plants are self-infertile. So if a pollen grain within the plant lands on its own stigma, it won't grow a pollen tube and fertilize itself. That way it can get genetic variation. So this pollen grain is from the same species, but from a different plant, and it's growing the pollen tube down and fertilizing the egg. If it's from a completely different species, then again, it will be like this. It won't grow a tube at all. All right, just a summary of monocots versus dicots. Monocots have one cotyledon, dicots two. Monocots have parallel leaf veins. Uh, dicots branch, branching leaf veins, and you can see the branching ones here. Um, petals and multiples of three for monocots, four and fives for dicots. Fibrous root system for monocot, tap roots for dicots. So you can see because they split so long ago, they're, they're structurally very different. Okay, um, here's a fruit. A fruit is an enlarged ripened ovary containing seeds. Here is a a pomegranate fruit hanging upside down. And you can see that uh, before it developed into a fruit, here was the flower over on this end. And you can see the, the sepal is still uh, very clearly still there. And within the flower, you can still see the stamens. They've kind of turned brown, but it's full of stamens. And fruits protect the seeds inside and they help in their dispersal. Uh, so here's a bird that's eating this fruit, and uh, it's going to put it through its digestive system, and it will digest the outside, but not the seeds, and then it will spread the seeds along with a little bit of fertilizer. So the plant is co-opting the animal to eat the fruit and spread its seeds. Uh, when we think of fruit, we often think of fleshy fruits, and a lot of the fruits that we buy in the grocery store are these fleshy fruits that are full of flesh and then there are seeds in the middle. Okay, the flesh is for animal dispersal. 
within the seed itself is material for the growing embryo. A lot of seeds in nature are dry at maturity. So when they're mature, they're not going to be spread by animals like this apple. Instead, these are uh, oleander seeds that are going to be spread by wind. So they dry out, the fruit opens up, it splits open, and they get spread by wind. So finally, we're back from uh, starting with the seed to having a fruit full of seeds. So the bean seed is dry to hissant. In other words, it opens up and spills its seeds out. And then when it starts growing, within the seed is a hard seed coat. So you need water and warm temperatures to get it growing. And then uh, most of the seed is stored starch. So when we have a bean burrito, we're eating all that stored starch that should go to the growing embryo. Don't worry, uh, plants don't have any nervous tissue, so it doesn't hurt the bean to, to make it into a burrito. But here's the baby plant that started to grow already, and it's feeding off the uh, endosperm that's uh, remobilized by the cotyledon into the growing embryo. Uh, finally, uh, just for fun, here's a little game called Supermarket Bar Botany. And there are pictures of all these plants and try and decide what plant part they are. So we'll go through and uh, if you look at the writing, it tells you what plant part it is. But um, obviously this is a root, so it's a tap root. And then this is your petiole and this is your leaf. So it's the tap root people usually eat. Although some people eat beet greens and this part up here. You can go through them all and you can see that. Okay, let me just flip through and I'll let you look at them yourself. 